Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. <laughs> wow, dude, that's pretty grim. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone tried to seduce me with a bunch of pickup lines about dying in worms, I'd have to think, he's just not that into you. Welcome to Waywards, where we take a few sidelong looks at literature to wonder where we ought to go. I'm Steve Chisnell, and this time we begin a long look at Andrew Marvel and his famous poem, To His Coy Mistress. You know, I have been teaching Andrew Marvel and his poetry for the last 20, maybe 25 years. Not once have I had a chance to really dig into the man's work, his thinking, all the arguments around his poems. In that same amount of time, there's been renewed interest in Marvel in the academic world, too. There's even an Andrew Marvel Society, which formed and now publishes a newsletter on this single poet from the 1600s. In his lifetime, he was known more for his politics than his poetry. Most of that was published anonymously because, uh, you know, it was pretty harsh. No, Andrew Marvel's not without his controversies, but as I said, until recently, we didn't give him too much thought. I think the guy that changed all this was another favorite of mine, T.S. Eliot. Back about a hundred years ago now, and by the way, that's about 250 years after Andrew Marvel, in a brief essay, Eliot claimed that Marvel was one of the greatest poets of human imagination. And actually, the poem to his coy mistress is a perfect exemplar. That's the poem we're going to be talking about over the next few episodes. Of all his poetry, probably one of the easiest to get into. It's famous because it was controversial, because of its misogyny, and somehow because of its complex and elusive meanings. As usual, though, the poem is the means for us to talk about some larger ideas in meaning-making and how literature works and what we can do with it. Now, you may know the poem already, but if you don't, don't worry. I'm going to share it with you today. You'll find a copy of it in the show notes, and there are plenty of resources about it on the Wayward's website. After we go through the poem, we'll talk about what the text is up to, but we're also going to investigate a little bit of the context, the history of Andrew Marvel, his life, the politics and schooling that shaped him, the traditions of poetry, and, you know, and the like. But we also talk about his misogyny, the obvious idea that he's not merely a lover or seducer of women, but something perhaps far worse. We'll talk about the nature of audiences. In other words, who is a poem written for? Who is it written to? And how does it matter? Finally, we'll end our little series with a discussion of whether or not a poem like this is even worth reading, worth talking about, worth teaching. Or is this a poem which is better left to the dust of history? So, let's settle in. We have a lot before us, and I don't even know everywhere we're yet going to travel. What is this, anyway? Now, To His Coy Mistress is a metaphysical poem in which the speaker attempts to persuade his supposedly resistant lover that they should have sexual intercourse. He explains that if they had all the time in the world, he would have no problem with their relationship moving this slowly. However, he goes on to explain they are mortal, and once they die, they'll be unable to be intimate together. Duh. The poem appears to serve two purposes. First, to persuade the mistress to love, and second, to comment on mortality and its inevitability and grotesqueness. It is this second objective which Eliot tells us adds to the philosophical aspect of the love poem. The poem is famous for its metaphysical imagery. It's what? The metaphysical poets, and there was a whole flock of them, 
Uh, we call them that now, by the way, metaphysical. They didn't all think of themselves as a club, but metaphysical poetry is a tendency or a trend in poetry at the time, kind of like how historians will call the narcissism we have around selfies and obsession with fictional self-image. The metaphysical poets did a few things mostly the same way. One, they loved metaphor, especially metaphors that were extended through several lines or even an entire poem. Two, these metaphors were used to philosophically link their big ideas to the physical world and small objects. John Donne, for instance, talked about spiritual communion and sex through a mere flea. Three, they were willing to take big risks to accomplish all of this, trying out different experiments in poetic form. And four, metaphysical poetry is about the philosophical conceit, not the mere surface topic or real-world subject. And it's about expressing a philosophical paradox. In other words, when we bring together all of these ideas, we end up with thoughts which seemingly contradict each other without either being exactly wrong. Most all of these guys, and yes, nearly all were men, were writing in Europe in the mid-1600s, and Andrew Marvel was among them. Now, Marvel fulfilled all of these qualities of metaphysical poetry. When we look at his larger collection of works, his lifetime of poetry and political writing, we see both an ambiguity and an unwillingness to be read simply. Andrew Marvel was not a superficial writer. T.S. Eliot in his, es in his essay said that Marvel is ambiguous, elusive, <laughs> and that's what makes him great. One of the best descriptions of Andrew Marvel poems I've seen says that Marvel employs a kind of verbal sfumato, an uncertainty of line that creates intrigue, prompts the reader to be more curious. Sfumato. Well, that's a crazy word. It's spelled S-F-U-M-A-T-O. Sfumato is a, actually a painting technique where light, tone, color, they all blur together, shading into one another, producing an uncertainty where one ends and the other begins. This is how I want us to think about Andrew Marvel's poetry, and in particular, this poem before us. I want us to see the poem not only for what its subject is, its story, but for its metaphysical nature, the politics of the Reformation around it, the slippage of authority, and even perhaps its queerness. We're going to explore the poem, as they say, through a glass darkly. And unfortunately, if you've come to this podcast hoping to find out what the poem means... I can only disappoint you. Instead, we're going to walk away with some genuine feeling of discomfiture. In other words, of a frustrating uncertainty which leaves us wanting more. Huh, if I didn't know any better, I'd say that's one of the qualities of desire. But enough introduction. Let's give the poem a listen. And if you're listening to the podcast right now, you'll find the entire poem in the show notes. Here it is. Get ready for this. To his coy mistress, Andrew Marvel, 1681. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness, lady, were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou, by the Indian Ganges side, shouldst rubies find. I, by the tide of Humber, would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires, and more slow. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest." An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, and nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor 
In thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. So now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in a slow-chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, Though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. Getting into the text. Okay. There's a lot there, and I certainly don't expect you to remember all of it right now, but let's start with an overview. Marvel's speaker essentially makes this point. Lady, you are awesome and you deserve nothing except being worshipped and adored for thousands of years. Mm, but we don't have that long. We're going to get old and die, and nobody is finding love in the grave. Therefore, while we're young, and you, of course, are still attractive, we should make love right now. Uh, yeah. So the poem's a giant pickup line, uh, this poem. And while it's flowery and has some lovely images and some not very lovely at all, he's basically telling her, quit playing hard to get because you're only young and hot like this right now. Uh, we can see, can't we, why this poem is so offensive to so many? We'll get to all of that for certain. But first, let's break it down. We don't really know who this coy lady is, do we? But our speaker calls her coy, which means that she's somehow and some why resisting his advances. He even understands it. He says, if we had time enough, this game of resistance would be perfectly fine. No crime. Then he goes on with a long series of things he would do if they had all the time in the world. She would be on the other side of the world in India finding rubies. He'd be at home in England in his hometown of Humber complaining, waiting. But it doesn't matter. He would still love her from the time of the Old Testament, before the flood, until the conversion of the Jews, a phrase, I guess, meaning till the end of time, and because the Jewish people are unlikely to convert to Christianity anytime soon. And then we come upon an unusual image, one that has been read and misread across the years. He describes his love as a vegetable love. Now, before you start thinking of some giant ball of lettuce that grows across Europe and as a metaphor for his love, you should know that this is a metaphor that was somewhat common in Marvel's time. The soul had three components. The first was the rational soul, a quality possessed only by humans. The second was the sensitive soul, a quality that he was shared with that we shared with animals. And the final part of the soul was the vegetable soul, shared by all living things, and it has neither mind nor speed. It was the slowest growing, most, most organic part of us, that part of slow growth and decay. Very natural. He shows this, of course, by starting to adore each part of her with centuries. And as he says, she deserves this slow love, and he would not want to love her faster, that is, if they had all the world in time. So now we get to the second stanza, and though this is where he makes his argument a little more clearly. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Yes, time and death are coming up the rear, and soon it will catch up with us. We will age and we will die, deserts of vast eternity. So let's be clear. Thy beauty, her beauty, shall never more be found nor while she's lying in the marble vault, her tomb, will he be there to sing to her. But even more disgusting, the only thing that will be seducing her are the worms if she rots. And so that quaint honor, her coyness, becomes dust. And of course, so does his love. 
Nobody wants that. Nobody finds love in death. So this leads our speaker to his conclusion. So while your skin is young and glowing, while your pores are on fire, let us sport us while we may. In other words, let's make love. But he isn't satisfied, it seems, with a gentle love. He wants the kind of physical relationship of amorous birds of prey. He wants to tear our pleasures with rough strife. Ugh. Now, I don't want to get super explicit here, yet I do need to point out that there are, there are speakers pretty graphic with his metaphors. I described the lady's marble vault as a tomb a moment ago, but it also does sound like a pelvis where those worms are doing their business. And so the phrase quaint honor sounds very much like a physical virginity. And this third stanza has imagery of heat, fire, of sweat, of eating and biting. Yeah. And the poem gets weird here, even at the end, talking about time and iron gates of life and making the sun run, and we'll get to all of that. But for now, let's say that our speaker believes that their sex act will somehow affect their idea of time. If you want to find out more on the textual imagery in this poem, I have placed an annotated copy of the poem on the website that breaks all this down even further. The link to the website is in the show notes. Now, that's all the basics of the poem. Nobody really disagrees with this basic meaning. And it's enough to say, whoa, this guy is messed up. Leave the girl alone. Why are you being all creepy and death-like about this anyway? Now, these are good questions. But as I said at the beginning, we're going to have to dig a bit, travel a bit, in order to see what Marvel might be up to. A Poetic Link It's at this point that we need to introduce one of the philosophical ideas of the poem, the philosophy of carpe diem. Now, everyone who has lived in the 20th century or before knows this phrase. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Now, who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That seize the day. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. That was from the Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. He talks about a contemporary of Marvel's, Robert Herrick. No, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about Robert Herrick just now, but his poem, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time, is one of the more famous Carpe Diem poems. As Peter Keating, or Robin Williams, says, we should live our lives like there's no tomorrow, for we shall soon be food for worms. Let's listen to all of Herrick's poem so we can hear the similarities. To the Virgins to Make Much of Time by Robert Herrick. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. That age is best which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. But being spent, the worse, and worst time still, succeed the former. Then be not coy, but use your time, and while ye may, go marry. For having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Now, my point here is not so much that these two poets wrote the same ideas at the same time, or even that they used the same imagery, racing the sun, warm blood and youth, be not coy, but that, as we've learned in earlier episodes, authors built upon each other all the time, and they still do. Andrew Marvel did not invent seduction. He did not invent the Carpe Diem poem, nor did he invent the idea of using it to seduce women. This has, in fact, been done for thousands of years before Andrew Marvel. So, Carpe Diem is a philosophy which is well-known, well-understood, much-argued. 
Camille Paglia described Marvel's Carpe Diem poem as a, quote, brazenly pagan message. Hmm. Why pagan? Well, to seize the day and make as much of life as we can because we will soon die implies that there's nothing after death to look forward to. In other words, Carpe Diem suggests that there is no afterlife, heavenly or otherwise, for which we might be morally accountable. So somehow, in this poem, is a philosophical argument about what Christianity is, the soul, and what we're supposed to do with our lives. Let's dip just a bit into that philosophy. Traditional Criticism Okay. The speaker, some kind of courtier, has apparently urged an unsuccessful proposition on a younger lady. Eh, We presume the lady is younger because she's youthful, and our male speaker has some degree of education behind him, which suggests he's older. We call her a mistress, not because she's already his lover. That's more a modern definition of the word. But because a young, unmarried woman, especially one of some status, would have this as a title, you know, as in mistress and master. Thus, writing a poem like this is an educated art of nobility. How a proper gentleman makes love in the classic sense. Finding her reluctant, he is, as the poem opens, making use of his most eloquent line. But it is a line that reveals him to be, as I said, no common lover. All this imagery about time and death and racing sons, which we still haven't talked about, shows off his cleverness, his creativity, his imagination. After all, he says, we know nothing about any future life and have only the grimmest observation about the effects of death. So we might as well enjoy today. But this poem is, as a matter of fact, a specious argument viewed from the standpoint of formal logic. The fallacy is called denying the antecedent. In this case, the first part of the conditional statement beginning with if. If we have all the time and space in the world, your coyness is innocent. It's not criminal. But we do not have all the time and space in the world. Therefore, your coyness is not innocent. Both premises are true, but the conclusion is still false. You see, the lady's coyness may not be innocent for reasons other than the lover's not having all the time and space in the world. The male arguer obviously does not care whether his argument is valid or not as long as it achieves its purpose. As Pope so well said in The Rape of the Lock, For when success a lover's toil attends, few ask if fraud or force attained its ends. But if the seduction is Marvel's only purpose, it may or may not be the speaker's. Is the seduction... Marvel's only purpose? It may or may not be the speaker's, but remember that there is a difference between the author of a poem and its speaker. Sure, the speaker wants to seduce, but what is all this extra image stuff for? The opening line of the poem, Had We But World Enough in Time, introduces us to the space-time continuum. Had we, the speaker says, knowing that they do not, from that point on, the hyperbole, the playfulness, the grim fear of annihilation are all based on the feeling of the speaker that he is bound by the dimensions of space and time. This poem is a proposition made by the eternal male to the eternal female. That is, Marvel understands that he's writing the archetypal, the typical, the traditional love poem. The motif of space and time shows that this poem to be a philosophical consideration of time, of eternity, of man's pleasure, hedonism and of salvation in an afterlife, traditional Christianity. If we look through the poem, we find not a few, but dozens of words and images that relate to time and eternity. The last two lines of the poem are also about time. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. So, these lines might extend time backward to suggest Old Testament days and classical mythology. Joshua stopped the sun so that the Israelites could win a battle. And even better, Zeus lengthened the night he spent with Amphitryon's wife. Ah, so we do have a Christian image and a pagan image together here. 
both stopping time to accomplish more. But the Zeus parallel is still important. For the poem is also a love poem, both in its traditional context of the courtly love complaint and in the simple fact of its subject matter. Fearing that the afterlife may be a vast space without time, the speaker looks for a means of enjoying whatever he can. This carpe diem theme is not uncommon, nor is the theme of seduction. What gives the poem some unusual power, however, is this overbearing sense of a cold, calculated drive, this bad logic, to use the pleasures of sex to counterbalance the threats of empty eternity. Let's take a moment and rethink these three stanzas in terms of this philosophy of time. Stanza one is an ironic presentation of the escape from time to some paradise state where the lovers may dally for eternity. But such a state is a foolish delusion, as the speaker suggests in the had we but time, and as metaphor of a vegetable growing to infinite size in some archetypal garden, please. Stanza two then reverses this idea and discusses time in terms of the desert archetype governed by the inexorable laws of nature, and the sun symbol as a times-winged chariot, for instance, the laws of decay, of death. Stanza 2, therefore, is an extreme in its philosophical realism, just as stanza 1 is in the idealism. So you have idealism and then extreme realism. The third part presents a third kind of time, then, uh, an escape into cyclical time, and thereby a chance for immortality. Again, the sun archetype appears, but this is a sun of soul and instant fires, images not of death, but of creative energy fused with this fear. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. This archetype of primal wholeness and fulfillment. Hmm. Marvel's poet lover seems to offer the alchemy of love as a way of defeating the laws of natural time. Love is a means of participating in, even intensifying, the mysterious rhythms of nature's eternal cycle. If life is to be judged not by duration, but by intensity, then Marvel's lovers, at least during the act of love, will achieve a kind of immortality by devouring time, or by transcending the laws of clock time, you know, time's winged chariot. And if this alchemical transformation requires a fire hot enough to melt them into one primordial ball, well, it's perhaps also hot enough to melt the sun and make him run. Consider this. Now, is this a poem about a manipulative seduction? or a poem philosophizing about time and perhaps contrary to Christian thinking? Yes, both. Is this a poem mocking other love poetry, or a poem that sincerely wants to seduce a woman? Well, maybe yes, both. Is this a poem which talks back to other carpe diem poetry, arguing a point? Or is it perhaps an exercise for Marvel to work out these questions on his own? Also, yes. Perhaps. In the metaphysical tradition, is the seduction a metaphor for his philosophizing about time? Or does he use time images as a metaphor for how he must love? Huh. Yes. Okay. So I've offered you some quick takes on the poem and what it might mean, but we've hardly explored any at any length. All of that work is still ahead of us, we have some questions to deal with. We have to look at the nature of this sexual game Marvel is playing in the poem that's hardly itself innocent. We need to take a look at the consequences of this kind of seduction and what it means for the male psychology, what it means for women's social and political conditions, whether a poem like this should be given a public platform. We also need to address a question you might have right now, and that is, haven't we already gone too far in interpreting this poem? How do we know that Andrew Marvel was doing any of this? That he intended any of this? That he's not the dude in the poem seducing women? This is especially important when we recognize that this poem was likely written at the same time Marvel was living on a private estate tutoring a young girl. Hmm. We still need to look at this poem 
and who it was intended for. Is Marvel writing to other poets in the past? Is he writing to other poets and thinkers around him? Or is he writing to himself? And regardless of how we answer that question, we today are none of those audiences. What are we supposed to do with it? We also need to talk earnestly and honestly, not only about other readings and interpretations of this poem, like, why is this the worst pickup line ever? But also, what is the value of looking at these old poems anyway? Couldn't I more easily read some philosophy about time and the afterlife if I wanted to learn about it? Why did I need to do it through some super misogynistic quasi-rape poem like this one? All of these issues are in the episodes ahead. All we've done so far is raise some questions and offer some quick interpretations, much like you'd find from any classroom or any SparkNotes site. Think of this episode perhaps then as an introduction to the poem to his coy mistress. We still have to look backward a few thousand years, look more carefully at what Marvell knew and when he knew it, make some arguments for a concept called polysemy. Now, we've talked around this word before, but we've never used it. Polysemy means basically that many simultaneous interpretations of a work of literature are possible, all at the same time, even if they contradict each other, and that those contradictions and simultaneous meanings are themselves the meaning of the work. All of this is still ahead, and I hope you'll join us. The works of literature we've discussed already, and the ones we will discuss afterward, revolve in some ways around poems like this one. Poems out of traditional European white male history. Poems we have called the canon of literature. Poems we have chosen across our tradition because they teach what we want to have taught. But enough for now. Join us next week for more. And in the meantime, go read something. Follow us wherever you listen to podcasts and find us along with so many supplements, bonus episodes, and other surprises at waywardstudio.com. That's waywardstudio, two S's in the middle, dot com. Thanks for listening. Music for the Waywards podcast is by Randon Miles. Chapter headings by Natalie Harrison and Sarah Skoleski. The Waywards podcast is a production of Waywards Studio. Find us at waywardsstudio.com.